Welcome to the Explorers Podcast with Ken Bowen. Here, Ken connects with friends and peers to discuss issues in the world and practices to improve one's biblical perspective. Hi, this is Ken Bowen. I want to welcome you to the Explorers Podcast, and I'm with my wonderful associate, Zandra Greamy, who works with me in the Museum of Created Beauty. And uh, I want to welcome you, Zandra, for, uh, for our time together. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Delighted to be here. No, it's exciting because one of the things we're talking about and we've just been looking at is the created, this thing that we call the Created Beauty Series. And you and I, as scientists, are, are lovers of beauty and the uh, whole idea of God's world being the first source of beauty, even though fallen, it points beyond itself to mar- marvels and mysteries. In a, in a very real sense, you and I, are, as stewards and, and, and um, gardeners, are really gardening mystery. Never thought of it that way, but in a way, I'm gardening. We're gardening physical mystery. You see that that points beyond itself from the outside in to the from the seen through the senses to the unseen qualities about the one who made it, and then the idea of gardening second kind of mystery is spiritual mysteries in the word. So that in God's world, which is outside in, we're gardening spirit, phys, physical mysteries, plants and whatever gardens, but then. In God's second source of beauty, God's world, we're gardening spiritual mysteries, the mysteries of the revelation of the Lagos, so that the beauty of God points to the truth of God, which then in turn points to the to the goodness of God. And so we have then God's goodness is revealed in our third source of beauty, which is our response as bearers of the Imago Dei to the beauty, truth, and uh, and goodness of the living God. So what do you what what's your take on that as as God's mouthful? <laughs> it is a mouthful. I think of the the things that you mentioned beauty leading to truth as one of the things <clears throat> I've been thinking about the most recently. And at our most recent event in Washington DC, one of the attendees came up to me after my talk and gave me a book and she said I brought this for you and I want you to read it. And I think it would um, really encourage you. And just, it's a delightful read. And um, it's called This Beautiful Truth. Mm. And it's about how beauty is a signpost pointing to truth. Yes. Um, And so, yeah, I've really been enjoying reading through that and pondering through that because a lot of people think that beauty is some kind of ephemeral thing that doesn't really have any weight. It doesn't have any substance. It's just, you know, people's opinions, you know, some people like this flavor of ice cream and some people like that flavor of ice yeah, cream. Some yeah, people yeah. think this is beautiful. Some people think that is beautiful. Philosophers like Richard Swinburne would say, no, beauty is, we recognize beauty because it is. It's not beautiful because we say it is. Yes. Um, and so beauty as a source of truth is, I think, a, a marvelous idea and something I've been pondering on this week. Oh, that's very good. And when I speak about this idea of beauty, truth, and goodness, um, when you know, going back to the uh, Aristotelian approach to the um, the idea of claritas uh, or, or radiance, and the consonatia, which is proportionality, and the integritas, which is wholeness, I related it. To, so I connected the radiance um, idea of, of, of what's associated with truth. If it's beautiful, it's going to have a radiance about it. And that made me think about beauty as itself, but then proportionality related more to truth and the aspect of beauty that's that's cons- consonant with the way things ought to be. There's a there's this symmetry and viv- visual visual components. Like the, that's the satisfying dynamics of the Fibonacci series, <laughs> and and the Mandelbrot uh, sequence uh, series and the uh, the Julia set. All these things are exquisite and proportionate, and or, or and as they ought to be. And we see that beauty in all in the natural world. And then third is the um, goodness or the integritas that there's an integrity about that thing, which also relates to this question of beauty. So I, I think that, that um, Swinburne's exactly right, and that um, the whole idea of understanding beauty as being something that actually has its like Roger Scruton really emphasizes that same principle, doesn't he? Oh, you know what? 
It was Roger Scruton who said that. I don't know why I said Swinburne. I've been reading a lot about the crucifixion recently, so Swinburne's on the mind. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, well, Swinburne... I meant though, Roger he, Scruton, yeah. yeah but, but you know Swinburne would buy into this. He would, for he, sure, but he's not the he, one who said it, no, so my apologies. He was my... You know he was my first supervisor at Oxford. Was he? Wow. Yes. Yeah, because initially... I was planning to study in the area of the justification of religious belief because my, uh, my, my PhD was in the philosophy of religion. And so it was, I was beginning, I was going to be doing things on epistemology for Richard Swinburne, which was pretty, pretty daunting because this guy, he and Alvin Plantengay there in the 80s were the top two in the world on those realms. And so Swinburne uh, was my was my supervisor, but my thesis topic kept mutating away from because I re I wrote papers on epistemology for him until I figured out what I really wanted to do, and it was outside of his province. And then Ro Rowan Williams became my new supervisor. So hmm. it's kind of a change. I can't imagine, Ken. I mean, when I was at Oxford, I was studying at Wycliffe Hall, and he came a couple of times and gave some guest lectures. And I was intimidated just being in the room with him. I just can't imagine. Just being in the room with that man is an What was it like having him as your supervisor? Oh, I will tell you a word about that because it's absolutely, it was actually uh, extraordinary. Because when I first went to be with him, uh, to, to, to speak with him about that, um, I, uh, he brought out the sherry and he was very friendly and affable and so forth. And because I was looking at Oxford uh, at, at, or, or Cambridge and I saw I'd applied to both. So I wanted Oriel College because, you know, Swinburne was the um, ba basically they're associated with that in the whole area of the philosophy of religion. And before him, or Basil Mitchell also had been there. And I got to know Basil Mitchell as well. But Swinburne was very affable and so forth and very, very. But then when we met again, it was a different story when he became my supervisor. And he says, I, I'm Mr. Mr. Bo, I'm going to make you write and I'm going to make you think rigorously. And it was like, he was like my big knock, the great knock that Lewis had there. And, and remember the professor, uh, Kirk, um, mm -hmm. what was his name? Um, almost like that. But that whole idea of a man who was so rigorous so here's what it meant. There was no more sherry, by the way. And so what would <laughs> here's what would happen? Had to get down to business. Yeah, and think just think about this uh, because it's a rather fun uh, thing. If I can find it here, the uh, Oxford. Um, I'm trying to find my my Swinburne. Uh, the the justification of religious belief, but in the, at any rate. Um, I had to submit a paper on epistemology and I would give it to him three days in advance. And then when we would get there, we had 90 minutes and I had nowhere to hide. You know, it's easy to lip sync in the course of life, but we're all going to have to lip sync and <laughs> before Jesus. Well, the same thing here. You can't lip sync. I've got this world-class thinker. He's got my paper. Everything he's marked in my paper in red, he's going to inquire and he's going to force me to defend. So I had I was sweating bullets then for ninety minutes until he would say the, the the blessed word, fair enough, and then he'd go to the next one, <laughs> and so my job was to get him to say fair enough at the end. Um, so uh, I did this for a year. I first submitted four different papers as I was processing my thesis topic. As I said, kept mutating, but I have to say it was the most satisfying thing on the fourth paper when I wrote upon is, is belief in God properly basic. I remember at the end of the paper, he had two words and it was made, it was like for him, it was a backflip. It was like quite good. Oh, wow. Oh, I hope you framed that. Oh my gosh. I have that. Yeah, I have that. I can show how send it to you. And it was like the most satisfying. Then it made me think about the judgment seat of Christ. If I was so intimidated before a human being that I'm fearful of my encounter with him, how much more will that be then when I should have a sense of fear and yet desire to be standing before the King of Kings? If, 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 but there was a sort of a satisfying moment that that produced that I have to say really gave, made my day and it, it really gave me a perspective on life. It was, it was really very rich. So yeah, it was rigorous, but when it, it went into my thesis topic, went from the justification of religious belief and it mutated into 
the uh, theological and psychological accounts of human needs, a comparative study where I used six theologians and eight psychologists. That was outside of this province. And Richard Rowan Williams, who was there at that time at Christ Church at Oxford, uh, took on my thesis. And he then, after you know, you know, after after he left Christ Church, he became bishop of um, uh, in 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 uh, in Wales. And uh, he was at first, uh, and then he became. Uh, um, one area of Wales, and then he became Bishop of Wales. Then he became Archbishop of Canterbury. So I have the most beautiful stationery from him because after I was writing papers for him, after I had left Oxford, um, I would, instead of having a physical meeting with him, I'd send him a chapter and then we'd go over it by phone. So that was a, that was a lovely thing. So great opportunities, but that's a long, long answer to your question about Swinburne, but it's a fun story. It. Isn't it a fun it's story? A, it's a wonderful story. And I'm going to just... find you that, uh, that essay because I have yeah. to, I, you know, and because it actually shows, it shows that essay as he's marked it and all that as well. And I, I just need to, I'll, I'll find it and send it to you. You'll get a kick out of it. So quite I know that on there, you'll see. <laughs> I know I'm not meant to be interviewing you right now, but I'm just really curious. Your modified thesis then what what would be your elevator speech for what you found from looking at those psychologists and with regards to epistemology and yes what was the, main, the main takeaway of course i'm asking yes. you to summarize years of work but oh of course yeah but um that all came to pass by the way insofar as uh, um broadman and holman approached me as a, 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 a pretty reputable Christian publisher a couple of years after I, I wrote the thing and wanted to publish it as, and they called it Augustine to Freud, which was uh, kind of a much better title than my title. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because so on Augustine to Freud was what theologians and psychologists tell us about human nature and why it matters is what they called it, you see, which is a whole lot better than mine, psychological and theological approaches, accounts of human needs, a comparative study. But what I did do, though, was um, I have to say, I do not know, Zandra, how I ever got the thing complete. Because I, I look at this, I, and my I use here are my theologians, and, and this is theological models of human needs. Now, and you know they wrote pro, voluminously, and they didn't write about what they say about human needs in one book. book. So I had a scanner. So uh, uh, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Jonathan Edwards, Soren Kierkegaard, Paul Tillich, and Karl Rahner. I don't know ever know how I got through their work and uh, and and pulled out what they each said about human needs. But that's mm -hmm. that's that's what I was able to do. And Kierkegaard then, alone was so prolific. Oh my gosh! And he's the one theologian that that I, he's the one thinker that it was also in my NYU dissertation because I used him as my exemplar, one of my exemplars of of, of fideism in apologetics. So I he, I used him twice because uh, I love his work. Um, but then I did a crit. Then I had to do. Um, the, uh, the 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 psychological accounts and that consisted in a conflict model which was Freud Erickson Jung and Otto Rahn and the fulfillment model which is Maslow Rogers Adler and Fromm and once again they didn't say what they had to say in one little place either and so I don't know about how the grace of God worked in this but um, the the key chapter and I tell people if you want to get the net net of this book Augustine the Ford my Oxford D Phil thesis here re just read chapter eight it's a comparison and contrast of the theological and psychological models that's where I do a study of the convergence and divergence why do they converge because of the imago dei why do they de diverge because of their uh, their morality their basically their <laughs> metaphysics and their uh, morality their epistemology and and their axiology. That's why they do. But but it's amazing the amount of similarity. Then I look at metaphysical and moral assumptions and the psychological models, psychological accounts of theism and theological accounts of non-theism and so forth. So it was a bit, it was more. Um, what a wild ride. I don't know. It was Mr. Toad's wild ride. So I finally figured out what I wanted to do in the first year after I submitted that paper to Swinburne, the quite good paper. And then he, we, we admitted both that at this is outside of his area of expertise. And so we then went to uh, Rowan Williams. Um, and what I had to do though, is I had to go from, <coughs> I would lived in Oxford from 86 to 88, two years exactly. Wish I never sold that house. I, I could have kept the house, rented it, but that's why it's, it's the grace of God. Uh, it was a magical place. 
um, that we enjoyed. And I had to go from MPhil status, probationary M, 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 MLIT rather, to full MLIT status. And then from full MLIT, you have to go to a probationary DPhil. And then from probationary, you have to go to full DPhil status. And you have to do that before you can be supervised abroad. So I ch achieved the full DPhil status. And then I was allowed to be supervised abroad because I had it all outlined and so forth. But then I did the hard work when I came to America. So I must tell you, I almost completely dropped the ball. Because when I came back in 88, I got totally immersed. I was in, in Oxford. I was in a wonderful en environment and just reading and seeing and being and then it came back and the world exploded on me so i was year after year after year i wasn't making any progress to this crazy thing what was the explosion in 88 um well in in 88 um or when you came back to the united states oh the explosion of activity because you see i'm no longer now in oxford deep i'm not reading theology i'm work back with reflections ministries or research ministries at that time you see and so all oh, of a I sudden see. i thought you meant something bad had happened oh, no. and i was oh, trying to figure uh, yeah. out I'm, what it was okay, i'm just I being see. silly i'm just using a, a silly metaphor so you became very active when you were writing hyperactive and so you get totally involved in that and you put off and you put off and you know how it works the more you defer a thing the more oppressive the that the memory of it becomes and so yeah. it's a horrendous experience to uh, go through and so i right reached the point in about 19 um after two years I got to fish or get, or, you know, or, or cut bait. Either I'm going to, and I didn't want to waste all that work. So I, here's what I, I decided to go to bed one hour. I still remember where I was, um, where I was living and it was in Chad's Lake. And it was about 1990. I decided to do this two years later. I'm going to go to bed one hour early and get up one hour early. And that first hour, I'm going to be in front of my computer, and whether I like it or not, my joy won't be dependent on an outcome, but I'm just going to show up. I'm going to train my physicality to show up and let my and be faithful to the process, even if I don't accomplish anything. And, and I have to say, it was an inertia that was overcome by, this, by small steps of activity. And so that one little decision began gradually to overcome that weight of two years of total inertia. And bit by bit, I still remember the first day I sat there. I'll never forget it. But after that, I don't remember the days. It just whizzed by. And within a couple of months, um, a few, just a few months from there, I was done. You were, then, a, you were a germinating seed. I was a germinating seed. You and were a bamboo was, plant, just shooting, like yeah, growing. It, it, it was all late. Producing. It was all dormant. But then it, it, it produced its next state. Exactly. So everything liquefied. And then I had to create a new body plant <laughs> and metamorphose. Um, so that then evolved. And then I had to go over and defend it. And mm -hmm. I went over and defended it. And my defense committee, they, they, they approved it. But they said, you need to add two chapters. And they made it a better book by forcing me to add two chapters. One was a chapter which would be a critique of the six theologians. And another would be a chapter on a critique of the eight psychologists and that made it better because it then it's not just you what is your view of them and so i that's all part of this book and so i i i sent them and what what happened was rowan williams then would we we would instead of my flying over each time i would send him a chapter he would go over it with me and then when i was when i finished these two extra chapters uh they the, co the committee approved it and i was given my degree i didn't have to go over for for that but naturally, I later I went the next year for the ceremony because that's at the Sheldonian Theater and it's magnificent. Oh, I love the Sheldonian. Oh my word! Yeah, so wonderful concerts there. You you talked with him over the phone, and he was in England, and you were in the United States. Yeah, and it was a lot, lot cheaper than flying over. I can't imagine how expensive that was. Yeah, but, but it, like you said, cheaper than flying. A, a lot cheaper than flying over. Is it, yeah, oh boy. It, it answers itself, but. So we would literally, by email, set an appointment, and mm -hmm. so uh, Rowan and I would do that. And then, but by, by the time that by the time it was through, it, we're all through in '92, I guess it was, or uh, whatever the com completed year was. Um, I um, it was it was a grand thing because then I went over and, and flew. It was 1994 it was completed. Yeah, by that time he'd become, I think, the uh, 
the Archbishop of Canterbury. So it's got some pretty sumptuous stationery <laughs> when we'd correspond. Well, but it's a joy to remember that and the experience of doing that and then to have it published. Now, the, the, the Augustine of Freud just went out of print, so I had a right reversal. So I'm going to reprint it and it's easily done by print on demand. We're going to, we're going to do a, that. Easy. Through Trinity House Publishers? Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the beauty of print on a man, as you know, is that you don't have to have a big inventory anymore. In the past, you know, you had to print a thousand copies to get a reasonable price. Now you can just print 10 copies, five copies, whatever. No inventory, no big investment in stock. Change the rules for me. Mm -hmm. So, because I, I, I might as well make it available because it still was used as a textbook, you know, for psychology and theology. It's an interactive, it's an interdisciplinary textbook. Mm -hmm. So why not? Yeah, it makes sense. But now I want to talk with you about the the Created Beauty series. Yeah. First of all. Yeah, let's let's get your thoughts on that because I'm delighted with the uh, first book and as we were saying here this this first uh, sample and we're waiting for it to get in your hot little hands, you see. So once you're happy with it as I am and I I'd be surprised if you're not. We have the red light, the green light. Yeah. Well, I know it's a physical book because I can see you holding it. I just yeah. haven't got mine yet. Yeah, and you will get but... yours. Yeah. It's It's been such a joy to just imagine with you and kind of be creative and think about how could we make a series of small booklets that yeah. are full of beautiful yeah. images yes. and also some encouraging words and poetry and scriptures. And they're really just meant to be like, food for the soul a little yes, bit just a little yeah. when you're feeling famished pick one up and it's kind of like a little snack for your soul yes, a little nourishment it's just yep. full of beautiful words and images and um hopefully my words are beautiful too they're sometimes a oh, little are, dry yeah. and scientific but yeah, um you did it you did it beautifully i felt that the way you just speak about the these various wonderful topics including the lookalikes which i are always among my, among my favorites these bizarre creatures yeah some of them are just just wonderful and, and again it can't makes happen gradually it's, there's no gradual progression where they could mutate in such a manner no. and suddenly look like this yeah it's wonderful it just it's an embodiment of the diversity and creativity and i think the mirth of god you know the sometimes mirth, when yes. i look at these images like these oh. were that we're looking at here i think of the mirth of god that he oh, yeah. he smiles and he yeah. enjoys and he's got this little tickling laugh in his throat a little bit when he makes this orchid that looks just like a monkey face yeah I mean, um you, you and i yeah i think it's that. beautiful yeah, so it is it's both beautiful and whimsical and creative mm -hmm. uh all of those things at once it's just an, a, an actual marvel that way um, and then some of the behaviors some of the chemical processes in these plant yeah. systems. Yeah, um, you, you describe beautifully this uh, after talking about slipper orchids, then the most cunning orchid mm -hmm. uh, that we have a two page spread on that cunning orchid who emulates the, the pheromones of a, of a, and it just, this is astonishing how many stages. Describe that for us if you wouldn't mind. This is, this is one of the many marvels of symbiotic relationship. A symbiotic relationship means that two different organisms are working together in some way um, for so, some mutual common uh, or some, some mutually beneficial outcome. Yes. Uh -huh. So these beads, these beads, they're um, the odontoglossidae. Um, family of bees, and they're just beautiful. They're called orchid bees, and they all come in different colors. They're mm. this shining, beautiful, metallic, tiny little animal, and they're yes. just gorgeous yes. and colorful. They, and they live deep in the rainforest, and the males have this beautiful little dance that they do to attract a female, but most of the dance has to do with the cologne that he's wearing and yeah. the cologne that he gets is from these flowers. Each flower has a different type of smell and the more flowers he can visit and kind of snuggle up to and get some cologne on him from that flower, <laughs> the more variety she will smell yeah. um, during the mating dance and the more impressed she'll be. It's kind of one of those scenarios. <laughs> one of those scenarios. Yep. Apparently females like a lot of diversity. I don't know. So, um, yeah, it would yes. certainly appear with the uh, birds of paradise and the dances that they that they oh. have to observe. Oh my word! The bower birds, oh, birds yeah. of paradise, all yeah. of them, just Exquisite. incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, but the orchid, of course, 
in return gets pollinated by the bee if the bee falls into it. There's only one section inside of that orchid where he can climb out and it's made like I don't know if you've ever seen a climbing gym that has yes. those holds that yes. you can climb up. Yeah. It's just right for the bee. So he can climb up on those holes and holds and get out this opening in the back. But as he tries to squeeze out the back, <laughs> the flower glues a pollen packet to the thorax of this bee. And it d does not let him go until the glue is dried. And sometimes that takes, you know, 10, 15 minutes. So he just kind of sits there and waits. <laughs> and then once it's glued on, the orchid releases and lets him fly away. And the next orchid that he visits, if he happens to fall into that one as well by accident, that will pollinate yeah. the orchid. And it's just it's, the marvels of how everything fits together, like puzzle pieces. It's yes. just, and it's incredible to me. It's truly mind boggling. And this is just one example. There are so many orchids that so have many. different relationships with different animals um, I just picked this one because you and I have talked about it before, and yes. I'm always amazed by it. No, it's it's one of those wonders and gems. And you know there's a whimsy and there's a fun that's involved in that. And the Japanese puffer fish, we think about that and that wonderful rose window it creates. That, that marvel, it's so marvelous. It's, it, it rivals our best architecture in that respect and how it does this and then how the other, how they grab hold of a shell together uh, as the female finally comes into the center of that rose. And then they, they kind of have their, their mating while that time takes place. It's all fun. And it's gratuitous again. It's far, far beyond the needs of reproduction. All these things are just so far beyond any kind of um, need for survival on reproduction it's it's these are things that are and behaviors that are beautiful that emulate uh, wonders and truths and mysteries and dances and scenarios and parallaxes and and shapes and funnels and all these things he just loves diversity i have to tell you the more i'm i'm studying the natural world and as you know we've talked about this every year gets better for me than the one before because i'm able to see each year things i didn't see like I was given the blessing of a magnolia blossom that just opened up this morning. It'll only be here one day, right outside my window, the study window. And I'm already seeing, starting to get a little bit of brown on the bottom, but the exquisite glory, the fragrance, the marvel of that thing. But I think very few people, and this is part of our Museum of Created Beauty project, really attend to the message that God has given us that's outside in. And I think we regard it as an option rather than I think it can be demonstrated as being a mandate in scripture that we'd use nature as a force multiplier for awe and worship and wonder. Mm. Well, King Solomon certainly did in his books of wisdom. He, he constantly pointed back to <laughs> nature, you know. And then what can we learn Psalm from 19. the ant? Yeah, it, everything displays the glory of God. And, to let, and so. Um, the Psalm 107, all the all the psalms that describe this glory of God, and in, invite us to to look at the heavens and the earth and to behold and to see. And I think when we do that, God is pleased when we notice. I think because God wants to be known by us, He doesn't need to be known by us, no, but He wants he's, to be. He wants to be in relationship with us. To know us and be known by us is such a precious thing. Yeah. And when we look at nature, when we look at the beauty that we see, it doesn't just point to the fact that a creator exists. That would be one thing in and of itself. It points beyond that to his characteristics, his nature. As Roman says, you can learn about the nature of God. And I, when I look at nature, you know, as a biologist, I certainly see the fallenness of nature, but I also see in the shadows of glory, his love, yes. his intentionality. His love and intentionality. Yes. I mean, he's, he's not just a God who exists. He's a loving, caring, intentional God. And he, he pours so much into what he's created, what we see in these orchids or these beetles or these nebulae or the other, you know, created book booklets that will come out soon. We just see his love for us in all of that. Because if he takes that time creating a star, how much more time does he 
put into our lives, weaving our lives through. I think it's hard to be a deist when you look at nature with an open heart. Yeah, I think you're quite right about that, Sandra. The, in fact, I was thinking, what would it be if I did not have the second book of, 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 of beauty, this, the Bible, God's truth? What if I only had the first book, which is God's uh, world, not just his word? Um, I would probably conclude by looking at the world, the more I'm seeing now and the more I'm able to see, and I think that's true with you as well, the playfulness, the fecundity, the variety, the an enigmatic array of puzzles within puzzles within puzzles, like the periodic chart of the elements was not developed in, by, in one step, but by one puzzle opening up a door to another. Now we, now you're ready for the next one. It's like a mystery. And it's a, he's, it, the most brilliant uh, architect of all things is also the most brilliant pedagogue who reveals things bit by bit and then we're ready for them. And so we're seeing more now, you and I, than in the natural world, it's going up and flooding exponentially. But I think in a time of skepticism, it's needful for us to see, because if a person will just begin to look more carefully at their field of inquiry in the natural world, they'll realize it's just, this is more than what's, what I could imagine. Just, mm -hmm. just look at your hands, just study your hand and how that works or anything in the natural world, mystery. So I think it's a time for re recognizing that I, we can enhance our imagination through the stories of nature and through the, the wonderful mysteries. And that's our part of our purpose in these booklets, the Creative Beauty series. But also, um, let's talk a bit more about the museum of the of the of the of creative beauty in terms of the experience on the on a mobile device and on a on a desktop. Yeah. So um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to create these incredible cutting edge 3D um, worlds to explore. And so as we're continuing to raise funds for that and pouring resources into that, uh, we thought it might make sense to have a 2D version that's very mobile friendly yep. that anybody can use. And um, so that's online and it's, um, it's definitely still a work in progress. <laughs> I'm definitely every day going we're in learning. there trying to yeah. fix things and sort things out. And, um, but it's just, it's, an, it's a really great resource. And we got some positive feedback from someone who lives with his grandchild and they've made it their evening routine to go through this app. Isn't that a great and thing? their little boy will choose one night he'll choose tornadoes and another night he'll choose an interesting kind of fish or a bird or it's like a spider a yeah. and, wow. um, and read through. And so you get to read something about God's creation and certainly the scientific part of it, which is fascinating, but there's also a little takeaway at the end that's got a scripture. And, um, you know, I, we talked about how, what, what would it be like if you just had one book and not the other, Ken, like, what if you just had nature or what if yes. you just had the Bible, yes. but integrating the two, I think is quite powerful. It's and the Bible powerful. is replete with passages about nature Yes. It's constantly drawing on what we see in the natural world or the agricultural world to glean yes. wisdom for today. So Yes. Um, so we arrived at these 12 categories. And one, for example, out of the 12 was aquariums. And then within that, there would be 24 approximately uh, journeys that we would take. And so it led to 288. But there's really boundless number that you could have because you could have just uh, with the cephalopods, you could have the, the squid or you could have the, the uh, cuttlefish or you could have the uh, the, the um, uh, octopus, and so each is each is totally different. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but if you just fo focused on one, I just saw, a, um, uh, for example, a forty-five minute um, uh, story about a particularly a a a, a, a large um, octopus um, not far from Vancouver, that area, and how they took it and how they nurtured it and so forth. I got almost scared at what I was looking at. It was so utterly alien to me with 2,200 of these little suction cups and mm -hmm. each one it can use it in different ways and how it solved problems by knowing how to take this cork out of this bottle with a suction cup and so it could acquire the contents within very intelligent things very otherworldly very eerie with uh, really the eight brains plus the main one in the, the, the that they have but each and then you realize the, the, the delicacy and so forth and the responsiveness 
I was just almost overwhelmed. How could anyone begin to imagine such a wonder? And the more you look at it, the more bizarre, the more bizarre, alien, the more strange, but the more ingenious and intriguing it became. So mm -hmm. that just gave me a little bit of a hint of the glory of the mystery we call God. So it's, as I said before, if I only had the, the nature and not the, the second book of God's world, word, I suppose I'd be a panentheist. Mm -hmm. I'm just, because I need to be, I know there's something transcendent, but it wouldn't be probably personal. And because, every, you know, as you know, everyone wants to have the warm fuzzies of transcendence, but they don't want it to be personal. Because if it's personal, now we've got a problem. We're, we're, now we're there's responsibility. Yeah. And... But then, the, yeah. then, then when it reveals, the second word reveals that he is a person, but he's a person who sacrificed himself for us so that the one who gives you meaning gives you, or took your guilt. Now it becomes a love story, a romance. What greater imagination do you, can you have than that? So I think of the imagination of God, the diversity of God. And I'm now starting to think about things we can do that can amplify our, and populate our vision of what heaven will be like. So one thing I've been using, for example, is um, floral displays. There's this uh, Japanese woman who's a master at this, and she's creating these ethereal floral displays that draw me and make me want something. I'd love to be able to make that happen in, the, in eternity. And then I see the Michelin Guide for one and two and three star restaurants and these wonderful food preparations that they make that are sumptuous, involving almost all five senses, sometimes all five. <clears throat> And what is that a hint of? And our and our, our our gardening. We're, and then third, gardens, great gardens in the world. And so you could go from there. But I'm trying to use these things, put them together with music and so forth, and use them as an amplifier for wonder and worship. And that's what I'm trying trying to do when I'm outside too. Any plant I see, studying it and seeing it and feeling it. Yeah, and you're that way. Well, I think I'm learning a lot from you, Ken. I'm learning the practice of slowing down and savoring the moment and sometimes that looks like i find an interesting little flower growing in my lawn um well don't just walk past it you know if your house is on fire sure <clears throat> yeah. but usually the house is not on fire usually you have a moment to spare <laughs> usually you do you know and just to to allow the lord to invite you into that moment yeah, and right. take a moment to kneel down and feel the soft grass yeah. under your yeah. knees and look at that beautiful flower that's growing in the lawn and the speckles and the stripes and the color and noticing the the powdery yellow center and just to enjoy that that exists like you said for a moment that yeah. flower you woke up to this morning won't be there tomorrow morning yes that's right and there's something I think sacred and holy in stepping into those small moments of joy with the Lord. I think that's so. It, it becomes um, an invitation, and and as each time we respond to the Spirit's prompt through His beauty, I think we increase increase our acuity, consciousness, and awareness, to make it more likely we will see it the next time. But it requires every time, doesn't it? As you just you mentioned, if the house is on fire, but. You just mentioned a choice. You have a little micro choice between my chronos and God's kairos. And so that micro choice is then requires a third word, though, a kenosis. I've got to empty myself of my illusory agenda that I, I'm on a hurry and I need to get this done. And to realize that God's in, uh, in, invitations are often falsely construed as interruptions. And mm -hmm. so to die to my agenda, receive this. I had that just the other, just yesterday. I was looking at flocks, and I love this overall structure. But I said, I'm going to zoom into just one of those flowers in that flocks, and and felt the petal, and it was. I still remember how sumptuous it was to the touch. Just to just feel the petal, and you look at the inner color and the, the color within the color, and these these. It was just uh, it was uh, remarkable. The stigma, and the and the style. I'm looking at the stigma of this thing. This, you know, and I, I didn't have my loop with me. I should always carry my little loop so I can magnify it. I've got to get back in that habit. Mm -hmm. But if I do that, I'm training myself to a receptive acuity that God, I think, is pleased to, re to have. And, and, and it turns it into grace and, and gratitude, doesn't it? Well, and he's a father. So he's when father. we delight 
in yeah, the he, texture of that petal he when enjoys we that. smell and we have this delight it delights him because he's our father in the same way that you know if i have a little girl who sees a cute ladybug and she's so amazed and giggling i mean that's going to fill my heart with joy i yes. don't think it's any different with our father no in, 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 J. I. packer said the best summer i can think of of the of the good news is adoption through through propitiation and i love that idea of adoption because that metaphor of adoption you just used it god is our father not biological but our spiritual father but even here but by using the metaphor of a roman adoption ceremony of a new past a new present a new future that is so abundant and the father heart of God to be an actual element in the pleasure of God is beyond what we could have dreamed yet. So it is. Mm. That's, that's a reach. So he palpably pleasure, it takes pleasure in our appreciation of his beauty when we notice it and take the time to notice it and, and take the experience as I'm seek, seeking to do. And you do this as well. You did that with that little video that I like so much. Well, I think it's a good practice and I'm grateful to you for, yeah. for teaching me that because yeah. it gives us joy and it gives him worship. It and does. It's worth slowing down a It's worth bit. slowing down. So um, we'll keep working together on the, um, the Created Beauty series. Some of the other ones are going to be pollen mm -hmm. and seeds. Mm -hmm. And uh, another one is going to be, let's see. I think it's it. pollen and snowflakes up next. Pollen and snow and Seeds will be in our next batch. Beetles is in there. Good. I like We're kind of doing batches of five a little bit. I, I think. like that. I like that. When we, I can't wait to get that next, that first batch of five. And yeah. We're going to put them in a slip case so you and I can mm -hmm. see it. And each of the spines will have a beautifully different color. So the five will be, I like the idea of a black suit, a slip case because it'll emblazon those five that are sticking out and inviting us to be, look at me. And just <laughs> I think it's going to be so much fun to keep it's making good. these and they're going to be wonderful gifts for people because they you can are. choose five things. I mean, if I were to give one to my father, I would choose seahorses, space, um, oh, sure, space. you know, e something exoplanets. <laughs> exoplanets. He loves exoplanets. Yeah. Um, interesting bugs, you know, yeah, okay. and so I'd have those five chosen for him and give him a little slipcase for his birthday. Yeah, but yeah, because yeah, I think they're going to be fun to make, and I think they're going to bless a lot of people. I think they will as well. I'm, I'm I just think of, I couldn't resist this. This le le when I looked at leaf hoppers, for example, the, what what kind of a god was going to imagine such wonders as leaf hoppers with their crazy little stuff? Mm -hmm. Their their nature and these compound eyes but then it they just all deceptive and bizarre and strange it's the diversity the, the sheer diversity, diversity of color diversity. shape <laughs> size and that's not even including the nymphs no that's not, not the, even including that, the various that's a whole other world just the nymph is another world but these they go things, through different phases yeah you know three or four different instars yeah and one is red with purple spots and another is black with white stripes it's the same animal it's just changing over time and each with one is the so same with diverse. Cat caterpillars the same what is he doing what is this source of play of yeah. fecundity and so it that's why that I, it's trying to mate they're not able to mate they're not showing off <laughs> not at for all. any reason they're beautiful no. because god made them beautiful he made them beautiful and he loves the variety and the and the change and the the compound eyes and when i look at the compound eyes just of various butterfly species no two of them are interchangeable because some of them are green and some of them are blue and some are they're shaped differently and so where do they come from? It's just this infinite versity from the mystery we call God, who will never be bored, never, never be uh, saying. Because I've read in philosophers that some have said that an argument against the eternity of the soul, uh, immortality of the soul, is that you'd be bored in heaven, and all that shows is their deficiency of imagination. Yeah. They can't even begin. They haven't got the, the, the mind of a of a child, and a child like wonder. A person who knows how to play. How to play. No yeah. matter their age. Yeah. And is I've a been, person who understands how incredible yeah. the next world will be. As you know, my list of the attributes of God is about twice as large as I see in the books because I am, and because they're all left brain. <laughs> and so I'm using right, right brain images. So one of my attributes of God is play. Mm -hmm. Another one is, is, is joy. And another one is, um, being the great narrator, the greatest storyteller, the great architect, the great gardener, 
um, the great humorist, the humor and the fun that God has, the, how dazzling. So all these ideas and the perichoresis, the dance is another one of the metaphor. So why would they, those not also be in the list of God? So I'm looking forward to that time when, when all will be so, but right now we're participating, you and I. And it's in, a joy too. In making it available. So I'm glad for our time and for this. We'll, we'll do it, talk it again. We only scratch the surface. But the next time we talk, you will. We, we. I hope we'll have a few of these in our hands. Or I can't maybe, wait to see it. I can't wait to get my hands on one. I yeah. just want to smell it. There's something about the smell of the book. I know what book. you mean. Yeah, and and open it up nice, for the first time. Nice ink, nice thick paper. You'll like. Yeah, it. and I've never written a book before, so this, so this is, is extra awesome. exciting. Here you are, right there. I love it. So, yeah. let me know when it, it arrives. I will. Okay. I will. Well, good. I enjoyed our time together. And uh, well, we'll, and speaking of books, yeah, yeah. um. I have this this beautiful truth I mentioned. Do you want me to read you just a tiny bit? Oh, sure. sure. I think you'll Please appreciate yeah. this. I read this I last have, night. Yeah, send me a link to that if you think I should I read. I will. It. Yeah, I will. So, um, Sarah, the author, is describing how beauty can point to truth. Here, she says, over and over, I dismissed beauty as having any real bearing on my spiritual hunger or the larger story of my faith. Those instances of knowing seemed like small, ordinary things, powerful yet fleeting. And I'd been trained by the culture around me, even that of my church, to dismiss such trivialities as imagination or emotion. Mm. Art or music or the joy I felt in nature were frivolous things, pleasant in their way, but incapable of bearing truth. I was so deeply formed by the age in which I lived that I didn't yet understand that I could trust what a fallen leaf, or an autumn feast, a lilting song, or the coming of spring was speaking to me as true. I didn't see yet that these small glories had been offered to me as communion with my maker. Mm. Communion and then with she goes maker. on to talk about her transformation and thinking. But I just thought that was so true. And it's been my experience very similar to what she described and probably other people out there watching yeah have had a similar experience i can resonate with all those images she just gave because yeah. it's all part of that and and each one is the door to more so that you're able to see i love that for there's a growing acuity it's almost like the training in a skill and mm -hmm. gaining gaining proficiency and being an apprentice to the great master and the great artist the great king the great gardener the great uh architect and narrator and uh, and all the other aspects of beauty and that's why the th third source of beauty besides god's world and god's word is our response to god's world and his word through science through the arts through worship and that's precisely what we're called to do and and by doing that we're again we are gardening mystery both physical and spiritual mm -hmm. for the glory of the maker of all all things it's a nice mm -hmm. way of saying it. I think we're going to garden in heaven too, don't oh, you? I, I'm thinking a great deal about that. I, about, oh, we're going to be creating some wonderful things. And uh, I think, think the idea of seeing a thing and imagining, for example, all the fruit trees that exist and putting them into an orchid. And then let, let's rearrange them. Let's put them this way. Now let's put, do it by color. And. Mm -hmm boundless variations let's 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 imagine them all in one tree and let's let's the all, all, almost the whole idea of uh the the the, the, the planting and the 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 uh, creating new varieties and so forth i just love that idea so possibilities are boundless much to look forward to much to look forward to and i'm trying to anticipate it now with greater uh hints of what's to come those yeah. great moments of beauty, intimacy, and adventure that we enjoy in God's created world. And so, so much of that's related to the beauty of the natural world. So may it be so that we uh, increase people's acuity and that therefore appreciation and admiration and awe. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk soon. 
Thank you for this time, Ken. I've thoroughly you know, enjoyed it. No, me too. It was a great, and, and I, we just get started. I feel every time we talk. I know it's true. <laughs> We'd be here for days. <laughs> I know that. Uh, and then the sharing of the beauty as well, which is going to be when we share experiences and feel it together, there's something that adds that other dimension to it, another eye. So our little quirky group, for example, how often we did that. True. Yeah, very true. Thank you for being a part of the Explorers podcast. Please like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.